Okay, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and now I'm going to introduce our guests this afternoon. To my left, Inga Kuznetsova was born in the Krasdar region in Russia in 1974. She studied journalism, philosophy, and literary criticism at Moscow State University and published her first poems at 19 when she won the Pushkin National Prize. Her first book of poems, correct my translation here, uh, or my Russian pronunciation, Sni Sinitsi, yeah. which translates as Chickadee Dreams. Yes, that's right. Okay. Won the Triumph Prize and the Moscow Score Award for the best poetic debut in 2003. Kuznetsova's poems have been translated into English, French, Chinese, and Georgian. Uh, Jonathan Lethem's first novel, Gun with Occasional Music, was published in 1994. In 1999, Jonathan published Motherless Brooklyn, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award, a Macallan Gold Dagger, and was translated into nearly 30 languages. In 2003, he published The Fortress of Solitude, which became a New York Times bestseller and earned him a MacArthur Fellowship. Jonathan is also a prolific essayist and short story writer. His latest novel is Chronic City. Eshkol Nevo teaches creative writing at the Sam Spiegel Film School. He has published a collection of short stories, a book of nonfiction, and two novels, both of which have been bestsellers in Israel and were translated into several languages. His novel Homesick won the Raymond Wallier Prize in Paris in 2008 and has just been published by the Dalkey Archive here in the United States. Andre Stashuk received numerous awards for his work, including the NIKE, Poland's most prestigious literary prize. His books, Fado, Nine, Tales of Galicia, and White Raven have all been published in English to great acclaim. Forthcoming titles include Going to Babadag, that will be out from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and Dukla from the Dalkey Archive. I would also like to thank the two translators here on this stage. Translating for Andre is Eva Sklodowska, and translating for Inga, Laura Wolfson. So I want to thank you very much for your efforts today. and. Uh, I would like to begin with a short description of what we might be talking about today. Uh, utopia and dystopia, and what that might mean. Uh, utopia and dystopia seem to me to constitute certain geographies of the possible. And, and what that would mean to, to artists and literary artists uh, seems to me to be worth exploring. Uh, because these idealizations, they exist only in the imagination. The, the word utopia, of course, in the Greek means no place, no place in fact. Um, but certainly there have been many attempts to realize utopias, uh, some small, some large. Certainly the last century saw its share. And in the present century, we see fundamentalist religious groups of all stripes working toward their version of utopia whether it be the rapture or the caliphate. In any event, we do seem to look to novelists and poets to articulate our longing for a better world, as well as our dread of a worse one. The key word, though, I think for our discussion here is possibility. Does literature create possibilities, social, psychological, interpersonal, material, possibilities, and just how does this happen? So I'd like to start very, very generally uh, by asking each of you if this notion of creating possibility through your work uh, is something that you seek, you actively seek, or perhaps is it something that you, in fact, avoid? Uh, Maybe 
we could start with you, Jonathan. Sure. Um, <clears throat> thank, thank you, um, Albert, and, and thanks, everyone, um, for, for gathering uh, and for you coming to, to see this. Um, I, uh, well, I, I'm, I always, felt, always felt a very active engagement with the uh, notion of um, utopia and dystopia, uh, partly because I grew up as a reader inside the, the subculture of science fiction where those things are taken as uh, commonplaces uh, with a, with a uh, default meaning that, that no one questions. Of course, um, in the larger world of, of uh, politics or culture or, or literature per se, they're, they're quite, quite troublesome words, but in, in science fiction they simply name bunches of books. Um, and so this idea that you might be attracted to one or the other or both modes was something I auditioned uh, in a fairly um, uh, unassuming uh, way. It didn't bear an enormous freight of responsibility. It was mm -hmm. more a matter of my appetite for stories. I thought, uh, well, I like you know George Orwell and Philip K. Dick. I think I must be one of those dystopian people. Um, and. Uh, I, I, do, I do see my work in terms of um, framing possibilities, uh, but in, a, in an even more fundamental sense, before the, the possibilities are described, the very, um, the, the, the very fundamental act of asserting uh, the possibility of a, of, a, of a difference, of another world to be considered, to be auditioned, uh, let alone desired, is something that I think is, you know, it's very much at stake both in, in, um, in literary and political culture. Because I think that we live right now in a time where there is a certain degree of denial of, um, of utopian envisioning as a as legitimate uh, frame of reference. And, and um, you know, for, for me, it's always that urgent uh, uh, need to express the possibility of living in a world other than the one that you see around you that, um, that makes the imagination such a crucial element. And, and you know, in a way, the most, well, there's, there's a, you know, there's, there's a specific political context right now. Um, Slavo Žižek has this, uh, I think by now, sort of notorious remark where he says, it's actually easier to get people into a conversation about a meteor traveling through space and um, hitting the Earth and ending all life as we know it than it is to get people into a serious conversation about the end of, um, you know, the liberal capitalist consensus. <laughs> um, in other words, it's much easier to consider life itself ending on the planet than it is a different political uh, framework than the one we have accepted in some way as the sort of uh, inevitable, you know, um, uh, compromised ideal towards which we're all trudging uh, in a kind of, um, you know, uh, fatal consensus. And um, I think if you see the, the fundamental act of, the, 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 the primal act of the literary imagination is to immerse a single individual in the fact of or the possibility of another consciousness. That simply by reading a, a novel or poem, what we're doing is uh, accepting the possibility of a mind outside the one, the only one we can explore from within um, automatically. And the, not just the possibility, but the value of exploring another subjectivity. Then I think this is analogous to the, <laughs> the sort of, um, crucial, uh, fragile possibility that it could be valuable from within this fatal consensus to visualize some other form of, uh, you know, social organization uh, in our world. Do you think that, uh, and I'll put this to Andre, uh, is, is this imagining of some other form of social organization, uh, does it carry some risks? 
again, as I mentioned, the last, the last century was certainly marked by uh, several attempts to reimagine social organization. And here on the stage, we have mm -hmm. writers from, from Russia, from Poland, uh, from Israel, and certainly Jonathan from the United States, a country with its own messianic pretensions. Uh, we have a century uh, marked by F nationalist efforts to, to reorganize society along utopian lines. And in some of those cases, at least, there was dystopian fallout. So I wonder, uh, Andre, is this something you think about in your own work, this idea that the imagining of, of possible social alternatives uh, somehow might implicate the writer? Trudno mi powiedzieć, ale ja przez 30 lat rzeczywiście żyłem w systemie utopijnym i on był przede wszystkim nudny, więc jakby... E, nie, nie myślę o tym. Mnie zadowala rzeczywistość, którą oglądam. Um, it's difficult to say. I've been living for 30 years uh, in this system, and it was a utopian system, and I must say it was mostly boring. So I would say, no, I, I don't think about it. I'm actually quite satisfied with what surrounds me now. Ja tworzę utopie literackie, tworzę swoje światy bardzo prywatne, bardzo osobiste, które, które jakby zaspokajają moją potrzebę, prywatną potrzebę utopii gdzieś w rzeczywistości odmiennej, alternatywnej. A to są bardzo indywidualne, bardzo osobiste rzeczy, nie mają wiele wspólnego z społeczeństwem. Um, I create a literary utopie. But I would say it's a very private, very intimate uh, utopia that I create for my own purposes. I am not attempting to create any kind of uh, social utopia or trying to create a new world that would uh, show a different social uh, organization. Po prostu biorę świat, tnę go na kawałki, sklejam od nowa i to jest moja prywatna opowieść o utopii. To jest to, co... Uh, to, co lubię najbardziej w literaturze. I just take the world, I cut it into small pieces, then I glue it together again. And this is my history, this is what I like about the world, and this is what I like about my literary work. <laughs> well, I, I've read that as a young man, you left, left the Polish army, or perhaps uh, deserted the Polish army, and then joined a pacifist organization. Uh, that's certainly a, a utopian ideal. Uh, perhaps in your own life or in your political life or your life as a citizen, you allow yourself utopian goals, but not in your fiction? Więc jest to tylko część, część prawdy, bo rzeczywiście zdezerterowałem z wojska ale nie dlatego, że byłem pacyfistą. Nie byłem pacyfistą. Wojsko mnie znudziło w którymś momencie. Stwierdziłem, że teraz jest czas. Well, this is just half of the truth. Uh, it's true I deserted the army, but not because I was a pacifist. I did it because army was just very boring. I just, I decided it was time to leave. <laughs> Natomiast moi przyjaciele, którzy działali w ruchach pacyfistycznych, stwierdzili, że jestem cennym nabytkiem dla nich i w jakiś sposób pomagałem im pod. But uh, many of my friends who were active in pacifist movements decided I'm a very precious new, maybe not a member, but a precious person to be used to. And they helped me a lot. So maybe that's the connection. Wstyd się przyznać, ja lubiłem wojsko. Ja podejrzewam, że gdyby była wojna, to mnie zdezerterował jednak. I, I'm kind of ashamed to admit, but I liked the army. I imagine if there were a war, maybe I wouldn't have done it. I would stay. Niestety nie było wojny. But unfortunately, there was no war at that time. Well, a, a war probably would not be boring, at least. Inga? Wojna nie byłaby nudna, to prawda. War wouldn't have been boring, that's for sure. <laughs> Także takie są kulisy tych pozornie utopijnych gestów. Najczęściej stoi za tym lenistwo albo nuda, albo coś w tym rodzaju. So I would say this is kind of backstage on what's behind those apparently pacifistic or utopian gestures. Normally what's behind it's just boredom. 
or, or perhaps behind the creation of all art. Myślę, że tak, że sztuka, literatura jest odpowiedzią na nudę życia, rzeczywiście na lęk, na nudę, na, na człowieczeństwo takie. I, I think it's true. I think that art and literature might be an answer to a boredom of life, to some fear and also to our humanity, human condition. Inga, you also hail from a former communist country. <laughs> uh, how, how does having been born in one of the great utopias of the 20th century, how did that affect no. your decision to become a poet and your poetry? Наверное, жизнь в таком государстве, где была реализована одна из утопий, заставляет дистанцироваться от всего политического и такого агрессивно-утопического. Probably life in a state which uh, is a self-styled attempt at utopia forces one to distance oneself from that aggressive political stance. Я не знаю, как в Америке, но вот жизнь в Советском Союзе и знание истории государства говорит о том, что когда за дело берутся сообща много людей, стремящихся к власти, получается явная дистопия. Um, I don't know how it is in this country, in the United States, but knowledge of history of the Soviet Union tells us that when a lot of people undertake a common project together, what happens is there's um, a struggle for power and what you get is a dystopia. Мне кажется, что вообще существование государства, оно немножко принижает человека. Может быть, кто-то со мной не согласится, оно ориентировано на то, чтобы совместить очень разные воли и привести к какому-то среднему знаменателю. Um, some of you may not agree with me, but it's my opinion that the existence of a state uh, lowers or even uh, denigrates people because the purpose of a state or government is to bring together very, very many different interests and achieve a, a common denominator. Но на самом деле человек гораздо, это нечто гораздо большее. То есть он существует между землей и небом, и литература – это единственная область, область утопии, но реальная утопия, которая позволяет ему быть собой в полный рост. And literature is the only area where there is true utopia, which brings it all together. Слава Богу, сейчас государство не вмешивается в создание литературных текстов в нашей стране, как это было какое-то время назад. Thank God, uh, it's now the case that our government does not interfere in the creation of works of art as was the case for many, many years. Замечательные поэты не могли издавать свои книги, если они не прикрепляли к поэтическому сборнику так называемый паровоз. Я объясню. And there were superb poets who could not publish unless they attached themselves to a literary magazine as a sort of a caboose, and I'll explain what I mean. А паровоз – это текст, напиш, написанный во славу партии, во славу государственной утопии. Um, and what I mean by that is that the only way that they could get published was if they wrote a text which uh, exalted the party, the communist party, and the government, and that was able, that served to carry them and their real work through to the public. То есть это паровоз, который везет вагоны нормальных стихотворений. Uh, and so that was, that was like the car, not the caboose, sorry, the front car, which pulls the train behind it and brings it into the platform. А в другом случае, эта книга могла совершенно быть не напечатана, она в последний момент будет пущена под нож. 
Um, if there wasn't such a text attached to a work, a book might, at the last minute, not make it into print or be very severely cut. В России очень большая традиция текстов, которые писались в стол. Но я думаю, в Польше обстояло с этим не лучше. Um, in Russia, for a very long time, we had the tradition of writing for the desk drawer. That's what it was called, meaning when you knew that what you wrote was not going to be published. And I believe that the situation was very similar in Poland. А что касается выживания в эпицентре тоталитаризма, то есть я имею в виду сталинские времена, то русская классическая литература и классическая музыка, как русская, так и зарубежная, это была та спасительная область утопии, в свете которой можно было жить. During the very epicenter of totalitarianism, and by that I mean the Stalin years, um, Russian classic, Russian literature and classical music, both Russian classical music and uh, classical music from other countries, were kind of like an oasis um, where people could flee uh, from time to time to have a genuine sense of being alive. Вообще, мне, мне кажется, что чем меньше государство а, соотносится с, с пишущим, чем меньше оно диктует и контролирует, и, может быть, даже чем меньше помогает а, литературу материально или как-то иначе, тем лучше для качества текста, тем более абсолютным он будет. Um, it's my feeling that the greater the distance between the state and the creative writer, uh, the better that is for literature, um, and the better it is if there's less assistance of a material nature as well, for example. Мне кажется, что вот стихотворение это, – это чистая утопия. Утопия рая или детство человечества. И как читающий стихотворение, так и пишущий в момент погружения в него уже в раю и в абсолютно прекрасной области утопии. I believe that poetry is utopia, and both the readers and the writers of poetry at the moment when they are immersed in poetry are in heaven, in paradise. I think that's a, th that point and the point that you make about literature being something of a utopia lines up very nice with the, the etymology of the word, that it is no place, that utopia perhaps exists in language, it exists in the space between the reader's eyes and the page. But uh, uh, turning to Eshkol, uh, one of the last century's utopian vision certainly was the Zionist vision, which is very much about a place, a particular place, a particular plot of earth. And in your most recent novel, Homesick, you write very much about uh, a contested home and a contested place. Uh, is the notion of home and the notion of utopia, are these both idealizations and some, in some way unachievable phantoms? There's a lot there, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. First of all, good afternoon. Uh, it's been fascinating uh, to listen to all those different voices, different perspectives, and maybe I will add mine. Uh, as an Israeli, you can't underestimate the power of utopian literature. Israel was founded because of a, a utopian vision of Benjamin Zev Herzl, who wrote Alt Neuland, which is uh, old new uh, land. Uh, he wrote it more than 100 years ago. And uh, when, when the book came out, he was ridiculed uh, in, his own, in his own country by, by critics and by, and by readers. Uh, by the way, when, when you read this book in, in the eyes of, of, of today, uh, as a literature uh, creation, it has its problems. Uh, sometimes I imagine Alt Neuland brought to my writing workshop and, and examined in, in literature eyes, and the characters are not so, they're, they're quite uh, too expected. The narrative is not so, not so good, but, but this book, this, uh, this, this imagination, you talked about science fiction before. It was, it was science fiction to imagine a land, a territory for the Jews. And, and 60 years afterwards, it became, it became reality. 
Um, now, while becoming reality, while, while uh, realizing this dream, this utopia, it became a, a dystopia for, for, for another nation, the Palestinians. The 48 war was the realization of the utopia. It was also the creation of a dystopia for, for another nation. So what I'm trying to examine in my book, in, in Homesick, I'm, I'm talking about a couple of subjects there, a couple of, couple of different uh, kind of longings and homes and homesickness. Um, the book takes place in a little town called Maoz Zion Castle, and while I was researching the book, I found out that this Jewish town is living, or is situated on a Palestinian village, or a ruins of a Palestinian village. So I thought to myself, how can I write a book about homesickness without writing about people who were living there? They, this was their home. So what happens when a, a utopia of, of one nation meets a dystopia of another nation? In my book, it takes, it's, it's prose, it's a story, so it, it, it becomes very practical because I have an Arab construction worker and he's working in this Jewish neighborhood and suddenly he begins to suspect that the house in front of him is a house where he was born and raised as a child. So he goes to his mother and he asks, he asks her, is this the house? Is, is this the house of my childhood? And she says, maybe. So go and check. And not only go and check, you should, you should bring me something from this house. Uh, I, I forgot something behind in, in the 48 war, the war of independence, as it is called by Israelis, the Nakba, as it is called by Palestinians. And this Arab construction worker, in a moment, which is a, a, a junction of utopia and dystopia, he enters the house and he, and he wants something, something back from his childhood. So, so utopia and dystopia meet in, in Israel uh, any day, on a daily basis, and, and it's also happening in my book. Well, it's true that, that utopian ideation is often uh, a knife's edge away from dystopian reality, and it seems that, that novels uh, particularly science fiction novels, as you mentioned, Jonathan, uh, often uh, represent this, this dual nature of, of utopian, dystopian thought. While I, I understand that science fiction is not an American genre, it seems that a number of American writers brought it to particular fruition in the last century. I wonder if you see any connection between the dystopias of, say, Philip Dick, and uh, a particular sense of American optimism uh, at work with uh, American Calvinism, an American notion that everything will work out and the notion that everything is already doomed. Well, um, I mean, taking up uh, from Eshkol, is, am I saying your name more or less yeah. right? Uh, I, and, and, and your question, Albert, I, I think it's, it, there's, there's a striking thing that American identity and, and Israeli identity actually have in common, because we do live in the, in the only two countries I can think of that are basically science fiction novels, that are, that are or, or conceptual projects. You know, Manifest Destiny is a, is a concept, and the, the, the westward expansion, you know, and, and the acquisition of the, the, the you know, majority of our territory and the, the forging of a railway link. You know, these are, these are conceptual projects uh, along the lines, really, of, you know, we don't, we don't have one founding novel at, at our, at our uh, origin story, but, but the, the countries have that in common. And, of course, both of these are utopias laid over, or conceptual projects laid over the grounds of um, uh, the civilizations that happen to be... Um, uh, in place when we arrived. But, uh, you know, I, I'm very conscious of also being, in a funny way, uh, you know, I, I'm hardly a Palestinian, but I do feel that I'm the representative here of uh, a, a rare species, which is someone who came of age in a more or less conscious dystopia. And that is in the, in, in the sense that in New York in the 1970s, uh, you know, the the, the the early part of the 70s in particular, uh, it was a place because people were free uh, to, to declare their 
uh, disappointment with the collapse of the project. Uh, there was no, no, you know, mercifully, no political suppression of discontent. The definition of New York City, I thought of this today just realizing how the subways are sort of grinding towards ruin again. You know, they're canceling lines and it's reminding me a little bit of 1973. Uh, but this was a city that was consciously a fallen place. New York had been great and had, had collapsed, and everyone felt that way about it. And if you look at the art, the popular narratives uh, that emerged from New York City in that period, you know, Death Wish and the French Connection and um, Paula Fox's desperate characters, mm -hmm. uh, they're manifestly, you know, or, or, or Samuel, to take it back to science fiction, Samuel Delaney's great novel, uh, Dahlgren, they're manifestly stories about people who know they're living in ruins. And you know, the, the famous uh, Gerald Ford swipe you know, at, at, uh, at Abe Beam's bankrupt New York City, drop dead. Well, many people felt we were living in a kind of corpse of, a, of, a, of greatness. And that uh, people, sane people had fled and, and the people left behind were living in a kind of um, uh, uh, squalid, uh, dystopia, which paradoxically was exhilarating. And it also became, I mean, here I am talking to Patti Smith tomorrow on stage, it became <laughs> this opportunity and this kind of, um, this, th you know, and, and you, you encounter this in a, in a portrayal like, like Delaney's Dahlgren, it became a kind of uh, utopia by default, a, a, a place because power had abandoned it and privilege was receding in favor of a kind of, you know, anarchist, artistic, uh, you know, blank canvas. Anything could be created here, and it was terrifying and and um, and and thrilling at the same time. Um, that's you know. Not to claim any any special, uh, I don't know, a trauma. Uh, you know, I, I still was fundamentally living in in you know what I guess used to be called the first world <laughs> before the second world disappeared. Um, but um, but there was a, a a narrative quite different from the you know concept of westward expansion and the concept of uh, the culmination of an American. Uh, utopian narrative that it had failed already. And that was, you know, at Watergate, everything else, that was the consciousness I came of age from within. Oh, too bad, the story didn't work. <laughs> now what? What do we have now? It's, it's fascinating how at the same time all of this was happening and uh, here in the United States for many Israelis at the same years you're talking about, the 17th day of the 80s, America or the American dream was the utopia. Yeah. Uh, sometimes one country can be the utopia of, of another country. Uh, I think Jewish, the Jewish people have, have been split into half. Uh, at, at the 40s and 50s, half of them went, went to live in Israel and to create this utopia, and the other half went, went to the United States, more or less. And so, so since, the, since then, this, this is our, our other possibility. Uh, this, this, uh, this, the road not taken for Israelis is, 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 is Americanism and America and the American dream. So, so some, just when it was deteriorating, uh, like you were feeling it, it, it for Israelis it, it was a dream. Of course, I, I can't hear this, but think of Philip Roth's um, uh, Shylock, uh, Operation Shylock, where he, in, in typical Rothian agony, he thinks, again and again, how simple it would have been to carve out a more or less Israel-sized chunk of Montana or something and just hand it over and never have your, you know, <laughs> your, 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 your story have to go in this horrible direction. Well, I think that <laughs> this duality is certainly very interesting and, and without a doubt uh, something that you've written about a number of times, Chronic City, represents a New York where maximum possibility and maximum despair often exist in the same locale uh, simultaneously. And of course it is a matter of the eye of the beholder, as you say. Uh, Andre, your novel Nine uh, portrays a kind of post-communist, post-dystopia Poland, uh, but no one's very happy. Um, 
as Jonathan describes, authority receding from New York and leaving a somewhat more open, freer city uh, seemed to produce a, an explosion, perhaps, of, of artistic energy. But the world you depict in your novel, Nine, is a very unhappy place, even given the absence of communist tyranny. Excuse me, could you repeat the last that, words? That the world in the novel, Nine, is a very unhappy place. People there are unhappy. Uh, despite the absence of the communist system. Bardzo wiele ludzi w Polsce jest nieszczęśliwych właśnie tego, że przeminął. There are many people in Poland who are still very unhappy just because uh, communists passed. <laughs> Natomiast, uh, ale książka, książka, moja książka 9 nie jest ani o komunizmie, nie jest, o, nie jest książką polityczną. But my book nine is not about communism. It is not a political book. To jest książka po prostu o uwikłaniu w los, w nieszczęście, w splot okoliczności dziwnych, o samotności jest to książka. It's more book about loneliness. It's book about life that's been entangled in different coincidences and in different serendipities. Ludzie są w niej nieszczęśliwi, bo ludzie są nieszczęśliwi po prostu. People in this book are unhappy because people are unhappy. Myślę, że po trzech dniach w Nowym Jorku mógłbym napisać bardzo podobną książkę o Nowym Jorku. I think after having spent three days in New York, I could write a very similar book about New York. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of unhappiness here. It's, it's our chief export, I think. <laughs> um, but those are, I, I agree, those are the, the existential verities, how each individual relates to and somehow exists within a larger political sphere. Per, perhaps our, our metaphysical poet might have something to say about uh, those, how those existential issues uh, relate to, social, to various forms of social organization. Насколько я могла понять за то короткое время, в которое я нахожусь в Америке, американские поэты работают благодаря заботе государства о них, а в России поэты работают вопреки этой заботе, или это можно назвать как-то иначе. Uh, in the brief period that I've been in the United States, um, from what I've been able to understand, American poets work thanks to concern and care that's extended to them by the government, whereas Russian poets do their work despite an absence of the same. Даже, может быть, дело не в государстве, а в условиях. Здесь так тепло и хорошо, и я пока еще ничего не написала здесь, увы. Or maybe it's not uh, the government or the state that I'm referring to, actually. It's just the, the conditions. I mean, here it's so pleasant and it's so warm. And unfortunately, <laughs> I haven't written anything while I've been here, alas. Мне хотелось заниматься шопингом. Я не увлекаюсь алкогольными напитками, но тем не менее я не находилась на высшем уровне своего существа. Здесь. I did a bit of shopping. While I was here, I, I'm really not, um, I don't like to drink, but I find that while I've been here, I really haven't been my best and highest self. В России гораздо легче писать о высоком, о метафизике и о самой сути вещей. In Russia, it's much easier to write about the most exalted things, to write about metaphysics, the metaphysical, and to write about the highest things in life, the essence of life. Потому что физика, физическое существование более проблематично. Because, precisely because, physical existence is more problematic. Ну, может быть, я немножко преувеличиваю, но, но вот на своем опыте я почувствовала, что разница приличная. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, um, but uh, my own experience shows me that the difference is quite significant. В прошлом году у меня было такое ощущение, что вот 
то, что мы пишем, я и мои друзья, а в России сейчас очень хорошо с поэзией, что это никому не нужно. Это не нужно а, большому количеству людей. Last year I went through a period where I felt that the things that we are writing, my friends and I, and the situation with poetry is really quite favorable in Russia right now, but I did feel that what we were writing really wasn't needed or of interest to a, to a larger audience. Когда я прихожу на поэтические вечера, где нужно выступать мне или моим друзьям, я вижу все те же лица, я вижу писателей, поэтов, Критиков реже. And uh, when I go to poetry readings, either to read my own work or to hear my friends read, it's always the same people in the audience. Poets, writers, and critics. Not so many critics, though. I, I, I think given the general state of the literary climate, perhaps I don't know about in Russia, but certainly in the United States and perhaps elsewhere in which immediacy and clarity are uh, the, the chief requirements for, for mass consumption. I think perhaps writing poetry is a utopian gesture in and of itself. Я хотела бы прочитать стихотворение, которое было написано в прошлом году в таком довольно дистопическом настроении. И там есть аллюзия на работу Платона государства. Где, в, которой он, он, э, в которой он изгоняет поэтов за пределы города. I'd like to read a poem of mine, which I wrote last year, in a fairly dystopian uh, note. И теперь стихотворение. Все остыло, буковка осталась. Страшно потерять эту исчезающую малость, литературу. Ничего уже не помним. Стерлись полюса, как народ бросал камни и комья за ограду по леса. Ах, поэты, и жалеть не надо об официальном языке. Без награды шляйтесь вне ограды, думая о музыке. Может быть, я попробую передать более коротко смысл стихотворения. Дух ушел, осталась только буква. Это одна буква, это и есть литература. The remaining letter is literature. Люди уже ничего не помнят. Они не помнят, как изгоняли поэтов за ограду города и бросали в них со стены камни и комки земли. And people no longer remember the fact that the poets were driven out beyond the gates of the city and that people stood on the city wall and hurled rocks and uh, clumps of earth at them. Но поэты, пожалуйста, не расстраивайтесь. But poets, please, don't get upset. Без всякой награды, без всякой поддержки, свободно гуляйте за пределами стены и думайте только о музыке. Because without any awards, without any attention or support, you can stroll freely outside the city walls, free to think of nothing but music. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it seems that we return again to this idea that perhaps in artistic expression or particularly in literary expression, musical expression, uh, there is a kind of uh, an achievable ideal, or at least as close as we can come. Uh, Eshkel, I was reading about your newest novel, which has yet to be translated, and uh, Apparently, it's about a group of friends who exchange notes upon which they've written wishes, which I'm not sure. This seems to put me in mind of what's done at the Wailing Wall, where prayers are inserted in the blocks of stone. But when I was reading about that, I thought that that in some way was emblematic of 
the literary process of, uh, or at least perhaps a, a utopian minded literary process that is uh, these, these short poems that express aspiration or hope that are passed among, among like-minded like -minded people. Could you comment on that? Yeah, the, the starting point of this, of this book uh, is the World Cup of 1998, and there's a bunch of friends, they're sitting and watching the finals, and one of them has an idea. Let's take notes, and everyone will write down his, his three wishes to the forthcoming four years. So it can be a wish about romantic life, professional life, maybe even a national wish. And we will take these notes and keep them hidden. And within four years, after four years, in the next World Cup, we will open them and see what happens. Um, this is the starting point of the book. And, and the book follows the wishes, follows these four friends and examines whether a wish you make or a, a statement you make of what you want uh, where are you heading? Uh, is it really what you want? Is it, is it the path you are going to walk? Um, I think in Israel now there's a very popular, I don't know if it's still like, uh, like that here, there are a lot of coaching. Coaching and coaches. Like a, a life coach, someone a life that helps coach. you yeah, yeah, perfect yeah. So, yourself. So you, you sit in a cafe and you, you hear a lot of conversations of, of coaches and then there's all, it's all about goals and sub goals and sub sub goals, uh, and and this is it's also a book about this about is it really like that is it really like you you state your goals and then you just state your sub goals and then you go ahead and, and fulfill them uh, in 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 this in this book it's it's not like that it's more it's it's the stream of life it's looking on this stream of life uh, and examining what does it do to wishes or to your wishes as as time passes as you grow up as as your country is changing uh, maybe so yes it it was definitely a, a book uh, the energy of, of, of the book was towards the future. I was really, after I wrote Homesick, which is homesick, which is looking at the past and longing to the past, uh, I really felt I want, I want to look ahead. I want, I want to look towards the future uh, as, as a person, as, as, a, as a human being, as a writer. So, so writing these, these wishes was also kind of my wish. I, I want to... I want to write a book about what is it to, to think of a future? Um, what is it to go towards a future? Well, I think that perhaps one definition of a utopia might be uh, rules for a provisional future. And, and I think that when we look at any number of literary utopias, they are Plato's Atlantis or uh, Sir Thomas More's Utopia. These are places that are very rule-bound. I mean, most utopian novels, in fact, are largely constituted of, of very, very specific anal retentive style rules. And thinking about this, I, I, and trying to find some, something that was analogous, or a way in which that process was analogous, essentially, to the creation of literature, I realized that, that a good deal of writing uh, seeks rules. We write in genres, we adopt poetic forms, whether it's the sonnet, rhymed couplets, we, uh, we adopt particular narrative forms, first person, third person, diary, and there's a way in which the creation of literature is very much like the creation of a utopia. It's uh, working, generating and working within a system of rules. Uh, Jonathan, you play a lot, around a lot with genre. I wonder yeah. if you see a connection there. Oh yeah, no, I, I really like the 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 um, the direction you're gesturing, and it, it it strikes me that the key word, in a way, is provisional. Uh, but also, when you speak of rules, you're speaking of a world of uh, of games, of um, things that are both artificial and temporary, but can still be embraced. And I think one way to maybe um, uh, embrace the notion of, of utopian longing is to try to um, take away this 
image of utopia as something that needs to be monolithic and indefinite and without boundaries, and instead look at it as um, a, a kind of uprising of a zone of operation, a game that can be played successfully for a little while and may also inevitably dissolve. And you know, there's uh, the, the American anarchist philosopher Hakim Bey has this phrase, temporary autonomous zones. And what he has in mind are places like uh, the, um, the Burning Man uh, festival that, that, that arise according to a yearly schedule for a few brief days out in the desert where people gather and uh, with a concentrated, extremely deliberate, extremely artificial energy create a temporary autonomous zone of utopia where everything must be negotiated. It's very much like, in a sense, a game or, or a literary genre where the apparatus is conscious and the construction of it is part of the um, pleasure. It's not meant to be naturalized. It isn't meant to be something that can just uh, be finished. The rule, the rule making is done, and then it will go on forever and be perfect. Instead, the making of it becomes the utopia. And it also is uh, an accepted part of this practice of the temporary autonomous zone that it will melt away. And the hope is that these moments of utopia can be asserted again and again. And of course, that is what artistic practice is like, that's what the poetry reading is like, that group of people, the same faces showing up, uh, caring about the poems again and again, is in a sense one of those temporary autonomous zones, uh, uh, you know, or, or this panel itself could be taken as one, you know, here's, uh, with, with the extraordinary help of the translators, here are these conversations across cultures happening in an extremely artificial and structured way, thanks to your, your orchestration, but no less beautiful for its artificiality or the fact that an hour later we'll all go off to our separate lives. It will still have been a kind of utopia. Uh, just to play devil's advocate for just a bit, Jonathan, I, I, I agree with everything you said about the, the aestheticization of, of utopia as a set of temporary rules. But I wonder if that, and the reason I agree with you is because I too am the child of a country in which um, the rules often can be temporary because they are subject to democratic process. And I wonder if, for instance, Andre or Inga might see the notion of, of rules or the utopian or dystopian rules as, as malleable as, as you or I might, or as, as much the object of um, aestheticization. Andre, uh, what do you think of the notion that Jonathan puts forward that utopias are, are games? They're really games that come with a set of rules that we can choose to play or not. I'm a very bad example because I've never played any games. Myślę, że mam zupełnie inne spojrzenie na rzeczywistość. Mnie raczej interesuje brak reguł, czyli chaos życia, który próbujemy czasami otworzyć w literaturze. To mnie najbardziej pociąga. Uh, I'm not really interested in rules. Uh, what I'm more interested in is the chaos of life to that we try to uh, recreate in literature. Natomiast po raz kolejny padnie słowo nuda. Zawsze strasznie się nudziłem podczas jakichkolwiek gier. Again, I have to speak about boredom. I, I, I've been always bored during games. Nie potrafiłem grać ani w karty, ani w gry jakieś intelektualne, ani tym bardziej nigdy się nie bawiłem literaturą, która jest ściśle sformalizowana, bardzo intelektualna, jak na przykład Raymond Russell. To, to, to ja nie potrafiłem tego robić. Mięso mnie interesuje, życie. I was never able to play cards or play any other kind of games. I was really never interested in any kind of formal rules. What I really like is uh, the lack of rules. I like, uh, I never liked literature that was, uh, that consisted of many rules. What I actually like is more, li more the, the, the real life, what I would call like the flesh, the real flesh of life. Może, może to jest... Uh... 
Może to jest kolejna utopia oczywiście, być może tak jest, że, Maybe this że tak is... naprawdę nie żyjemy poza grą, ale ja sobie wyobrażam, że jednak żyjemy. Maybe this is a kind of utopia. Maybe we do not live beyond games, but this is what I would like to imagine, that that's, that's how we live. Without the rules. Może prawdziwe życie jest rzeczywiście utopią, takim wymysłem naszym, do którego gdzieś się odwołujemy. Może tak być. Perhaps the real life is a utopy. Maybe it is, uh, it is this kind of rules that we try not to look at. Po prostu jest to zawsze kwestia temperamentu. Wybieramy sobie różne, różne utopie. It's a matter of temperament. We just choose our utopies. Albo utopie gry, albo utopie prawdziwego tak zwanego życia. Either it's a utopy of a game, or it's the one of the real life. Well, in any event, it seems that creating the game is less boring than perhaps playing it, or at least according According to Andrzej, Inga, you wanted to add to ja that? I wanted to say that I very well understand Andrzej. I don't know if it happens because we lived in the Western conditions or why it's different, but I don't like the rules of the game and the collective games. Oh, the collective games, that's not at all. Let's not talk about collectives. I wanted to say that I understand very well what Andrzej was saying, and I don't know whether it's because we lived for a long time in very similar conditions or if it's for some other reason, but I just can't stand rules, games, and any kind of collective effort. Я то, что происходит здесь, я воспринимаю не как очень искусственную игру. То есть для меня акцент стоит на другом, а мне очень радостно от того, что я слышу, как мне кажется, что происходит внутри всех говорящих. Um, and what's going on here right now, I don't perceive at all as um, a game or something artificial. I'm very glad that I'm having, and the way I perceive it is the opportunity to hear what's going on inside those, in the minds and hearts of those who are speaking. Ведь мы говорим о том, что важно для всех нас. Мы говорим о большом существовании, о, о том, чтобы быть полностью собой в своей личной утопии или в своем личном мифе, куда мы можем впускать других, кто захочет туда прийти. Uh, what we're talking about is what is important to us. We're talking about uh, existence in the broad sense. And we are uh, we are allowing each other to enter into each other's personal utopias. То есть на самом деле утопия наша личная утопия не противоречит пониманию других и и любви. То есть то есть это такая мерцающая область. А там нет стены, какой бы ты ни было. И это это скорее поле что-то такое похожее на туман. Поле, мыслительное поле. И неважно, интеллектуалы или те, кто говорит об этом, или нет, но существует поле мысли и, и какой-то расположенности друг к друг другу. И только в этом поле и можно что-то понять об утопии или о чем бы то ни было другом. And um, the fact that we all have our personal utopias is not an obstacle for us to enter into each other's utopias or to try to understand them. Um, this is a global exercise without barriers, without walls. It's like a, a field of thought that's kind of like a cloud that we can all move around in. And it's not important whether the conversation is intellectual or not. It's important that there's this thought field that we're all in. Well, thinking of that cloud, I'm, I'm reminded, of, I think that it was, someone can correct me, was it Lionel Trilling who described New York or, or New Yorkers uh, as being eight million people with their personal Waldens, <laughs> referring to Thoreau's uh, rural utopian community. Uh, I, I want to, we're, we're nearing the end of the panel, and I just wanted to return to, to Eshkol and this idea of, of Herzl's novel and, and a nation springing from a novel. Because I think that uh, as writers, we often uh, are inclined to undervalue the power of literary expression. And certainly, if one can think of this novel or of Orwell's, which I think was absolutely formative in, I think you could probably trace a line from, from Orwell to the fall of the Berlin Wall, perhaps. So maybe you could uh, 
talk a little bit more about that, and we could then turn to the audience for some questions. Okay. I think, uh, as a writer, I don't, I don't have aspirations of uh, writing a novel who will, f uh, will format a country. But, but every writer, and even if he denies it, ha has an aspiration to, to make an effect on the world. And coming back to, to Homesick and to the, 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 um, the story I was telling, um, one of the things that happened with this book, uh, it became uh, part of the education system in Israel, which is kind of embarrassing in a way, because people have to take exams on this book. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, Israeli Jewish students in Israeli Jewish high schools are, are exposed to this Palestinian narrative of, of longing, which is kind of a utopia in Israel because it's, it's not a subject talked about, it's not a subject learned in history lessons. So then there's this student and he goes to history lesson and, and he's, heard, he's hearing, hearing one version and then he maybe he goes to literature lesson and he's learning my book and he's hearing the perspective of the other and, and he's, he's probably confused, which is great. So I, I think as a writer, I, I, aspire, I aspire to confuse, to raise, to raise questions. And it doesn't have to be in, a, in, a, in the political social area. It can be in, in a, an emotional level. Uh, this book you talked about, my next book in Hebrew, uh, World Cup Wishes, is about friendship. Friendship as a value in a very capitalistic, uh, capitalistic world. So when somebody comes to me or, or even writes me a letter about the book and, he, and he's saying, I read your book and I, then I called all my friends and, and we met together and it reminded me of, of friendship and how valuable it is. So this is, this is not for mating a country, but this, this is doing something with, with your words. Uh, uh, and, it, and if we were not aspiring to do it, I, I guess we wouldn't write because it's, it's not about only our self-amusement or our self-zone. We, we, we enjoy this zone that Jonathan w was talking about. I, I definitely feel the zone <laughs> when I'm writing, but it's not only about this. You, we, you want to make an effect. Uh, I guess in our times, you have to be more moderate in, in your aspirations and, and realistic. Uh, but, but if you can touch someone, if you can make, make him stop for a moment and think about love, about friendship, about the place he's living in, about his relationship, about his family, th then you have made something. It was, it was worthwhile, not only for you, but, but for your reader. Does anyone want to add anything to that? It was a beautiful end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the rules. So, if there are any questions from the audience, what you should do is come down the aisles on either side of the auditorium and speak into the microphone. This is being recorded. Uh, so, if you could come to the microphone and address your question to the panel, that would be wonderful. I have a question for Inga. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> um, do you believe that poetry is more suitable for the description of uh, utopias um, and prose is more connected to dystopias or do you believe there is no connection between that? Не имеет значения. Мне кажется, что любой получившийся текст, как поэтический, так и прозаический, это это утопия к к счастью и к позитиву. Um, the question was, uh, do you think that poetry is more appropriate for describing utopias and prose for dystopias, or do you think it makes no difference? And the answer was, uh, it doesn't make any difference. Any successful text, be it poetry or prose, is, is a utopia in and of itself. Он, он просто гораздо более удачно организован, чем любые социальные структуры. Такое мое анархическое мнение. 
And such a text is simply far better organized than any social structure, at least that's my anarchic or anarchistic <laughs> opinion on the matter. Thank you. I had a question, this is uh, for the whole panel in general. In the panel description, um, one of the questions arose, uh, I think, on is it possible to write a utopia now? And um, the, the sort of in the traditional sense of the utopia, sort of imagining a future in a kind of uh, naive and innocent perfection, um, even in young adult fiction now, uh, visions of the future are almost exclusively dystopian. And I'm wondering, is it possible uh, in our age of irony um, to have a, a sort of that kind of naive and, and uh, purely positivist view of the future? That's an excellent question. Does anyone want to take that up? It's a very complex question. It's 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 terribly difficult to do it. I'm, I'm your question. Um, I'm, I'm faced with a dile dilemma now, because I never talk about the book I'm writing. Mm -hmm. I have this this belief that it's not good to talk about the book you're writing, uh, but uh, but I have no choice now. Uh, and I, I'm try I, I I try not not to write. A, I'm not writing a, a utopia. I'm not writing Alt Neuland again. Uh, but I'm, I, I tried, in a, in a section of the book I'm writing now, I tried to write this, uh, to describe a little place, not, not in Israel, which runs by, by certain rules, uh, maybe utopian rules. And it was very, very difficult uh, to write. There was this cynical demon inside of me, laughing at me while I was writing all the time. <coughs> Uh, you, you can't, you can't be serious now, uh, but still I was striving to do it, and I'm still in the middle of the process, so I, I don't know if I, I, if I had made it or not, but it's, it's definitely difficult, definitely a very, very um, complex task to take uh, as a writer nowadays. Anyone else? Yeah, I pop culture, yes. I think that współczesna pop culture realizuje. Propuje nam proponować nieustanne utopie. I think that the the modern subculture tries to show or to make different utopias uh, true. Stu próbuje nam zaoferować możliwości stworzenia siebie na nowo jako jednostki. They offer us uh, opportunities to create ourselves new as a as a single human being. Możemy wybrać sobie osobowość, możemy wybrać sobie wygląd, możemy wy wybrać sobie Konstrukcję ciała już coraz częściej, bo się wymienia przecież narządy i części ciała. We could choose our own personality, we could choose uh, our, the way we look like, and we could choose even our body structure, because you could still uh, take different body organs. Możemy sobie wybrać model życia, strukturę naszego życia, możemy sobie wybrać miejsce, w którym chcemy żyć, od państwa aż po mieszkanie na przykład. We could choose the model or the structure of our life, we could choose the place we're going to live, uh, the country we want to live. To są propozycje popkultury, one są całkowicie utopijne. To, to tak wygląda w tej chwili, tak jest moje zdanie. And these are the offers and the proposals of the subculture, which to my mind are just utopian. Subculture, sorry. Pop culture. Pop culture? Pop, pop culture. I'm pop sorry, I, un I heard subculture, it's pop culture. Yeah. Thank you. Инга? Я хотел добавить лишь то, что мы не можем выбрать отсутствие смерти, к сожалению. I simply wanted to add that the one thing we cannot choose is the absence of death, unfortunately. Myślę, że już niedługo będziemy nieśmiertelni, czyli najbogatsi będą. I think very soon we will be immortal. To jest kolejny. No, nie, no to, I hope. To, to, jest kolejna, to jest kolejna utopia, tak naprawdę najważniejsza we współczesnym świecie, utopia nieśmiertelności i to technologicznie jest realizowana już powoli. No przecież w końcu, co się najlepiej rozwija w tej chwili z nauk? Biotechnologia. It's, it's, it's the, next, the next utopia that we are going to deal with, being immortal, because when you think about what is, uh, which discipline is being now um, developed, is the biotechnology. Myślę, że nastąpi to w Ameryce, która jest wielka i bogata. I think this will happen in America, which is a huge and rich country. 
it's, it's very funny you should say that because per, part of the reason behind this panel or the ideation behind this panel is uh, the magazine that I edit, Book Forum, is doing a special section uh, inviting a number of writers to meditate on the notion of utopia and also various scholars and scientists. And one of the people we contacted was an architect who is designing a cryogenic palace where bodies will be kept uh, frozen uh, for eternity, uh, which I think is something, in fact, as Jonathan well knows, Philip Dick already uh, imagined. But such a thing is uh, the architectural drawings are on the table. So you're right, America may very well pioneer the utopia of immortality. Um, I think at, at this juncture, unless anyone has something brief to add, we might, uh, if there, are there any other questions? No? Is there anything anyone wants to add before we repair to the, or, to the foyer here? Go ahead, Inga. Маленькая реплика. Just a brief response to what was just said. Когда говорили о возможности замороженных тел, которые потом, может быть, удастся восстановить, я подумала о том, что э, в настоящих условиях единственный способ существовать вечно – это написать хороший литературный текст. When uh, the mention was just made about the cryogenic palace, where bodies will be preserved, frozen, until they can be reanimated when the technology exists, I want to say that in our present conditions, still the only way to achieve immortality is to write a really good work of literature. I want to thank you all for coming today, and I want to thank our guests, Inga, Laura, Jonathan, Eshko, Andre, and Eva for, I think, what I found to be a very, very compelling discussion <laughs> of a topic we don't think about every day. Uh, the authors will be in the room outside there, in the back of the auditorium, the foyer there, uh, where you can purchase their books and uh, continue, perhaps continue uh, the discussion with them. And uh, again, thank you for all coming. And please avail yourself of the remaining events here in the Penn International Literature Festival. Good afternoon. Jinky, thank you. Thank you.